kasaysayan ng kamalayan May mga layuning na itakda Ang susi ng katotohanan Ang diwa ng pagmamahalan Ang tulay ng pag-uugnayan At ang daan ng pag So to summarize what we have discussed, uh, just list down the words, the synonyms, or the phrases that uh, we came up with to bring out the idea of what uh, organic means, okay, uh, physically, biologically, and related to the, its spiritual meaning. So first of all, it, uh, I mentioned some words uh, which uh, you have I mean, if I miss out some words, then you just add to this. First is original. Organic can mean original. Untouched. Uh, from Shane and Ro. Ro. Uh, from Badadan. Pure. In Tagalog, we said that Taal, Dalisay, Payak. Okay. Uh, true. Pure. And uh, simple. Or simple. Your dad uh, gave uh, the word Edenic. From the word Eden. So, maybe another word for Edenic is paradisical or like paradise. And as uh, we discussed, we brought out the idea of organic being that original, untouched, raw, or pure uh, condition, physical condition, and the spiritual relationship between God and creation, of course, with the Creator. Uh, basically, that's what we laid down as our one of uh, the foundational uh, premises. We also said uh, organic can mean natural, uh, sp of course, spiritual. Uh, when we say organic, it, uh, we will later on discuss the root word of that word organic, which is organ. So we have organs, and every organ has a spiritual significance. As we all know, you know for whether you're uh, a student or a reader of the Bible or a believer we all know that and we also said that organic can mean living fresh and that's what raw or untouched mean uh, it's fresh uh, it all can also mean not human made or no chemical uh, no chemical was, uh, was added to it it's not artificial so it's not uh, human made it's not something that has been uh, developed or modified by man okay, or created by man in that sense uh, played around with uh, adapted to whatever uh, use that man may be uh, wanting to use it for no? uh, whether along or in, co in conflict with uh, God's plan for humanity and um, uh, the final one is uh, very important we said that uh, anything that is organic is as it is okay it exists or it is as it is why because it comes from god and we know that the name of god is the great i am uh, when he revealed himself to moses he said that his uh, he goes by the name of i am that i am so everything that comes from god especially his creation his pure creation in eden the Edenic conditions that we were talking about. Everything that comes from the I am is, it, it is, it is as it is. So that should be consistent. It's already perfect and uh, that's it. Beneficial for every good use meant for humans to exist and to live in abundance, in peace, in love, in good relationship. You know, the perfect Eden, but we know, as I told your dad, that as much as I wanted to avoid using one word like organic faith, I, you're coming up with a new paradigm, a new buzzword. No, uh, all of these words I mentioned can't describe what we, we meant. You know, but uh, we just wanted to have a phrase that will sort of synthesize everything uh, mm. that we are trying to present so that we can simplify it make it presentable and understandable to the ordinary uh, reader or the, our common listeners. 
So I guess that's uh, all I wanted to say. Then you can proceed, uh, brothers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to share a little bit about my um, summation of our discussion, especially on my side. Like uh, I don't know if I can be the voice of the people who question this, but for me, I'm addressing my own um, need for clarification on these on this. And one thing that I feel like we have to deal with when we discuss um, organic faith, is that yes, it it would re it really helps encapsulate a lot of the words, but it encap encapsulates so much that it brings with it its own baggage. And one thing on a spiritual level, I feel like the baggage it brings is a materialistic one. That there can be this materialistic side to bringing up organic. And addressing whether or not what what how far can we say is something untouched, right? So I, and exam a quick example is is it untouched when we grow it in a garden that we built? Is that untouched? How far is the how far can we say we can not get involved in the processes of development? Uh, and where where the words for the spiritual side of organic would be? How we could describe organic in a spiritual sense, which is something I feel like we'll go more in depth with later in this topic. Uh, I think overall that's uh, what I have to say and sum up what I've done is just contend with the meanings of the words. Um, I I guess with Dan, but uh, I think Dan has a uh, is dealing with connect with his audio right now. Last time I was asking for a definite example of uh, what is an organic faith, so it would not just be going around. Much better if we have an example of an organic faith, and then uh, probably identify it, and uh, we'll find out whether what we believe today is still considered organic faith, it's or longer uh, organic. It's already an organic kind of faith, so. You have to be very specific about that. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Brother Dan. Uh, by the way, I wanted to say that I appreciate your uh, points, your comments in this discussion. And without you, I don't think we will be able to come up with a really solid foundation or, I mean, try to lay down that foundation. And, uh, yeah, uh, as much as we want to go right ahead and show or present some specific you said kasi uh, what is an organic faith okay that would be a big a tall order because uh, faith is not something you can just hold in your hands uh, one hand uh, for that matter uh, it is something that really permeates everything in our life it is it's like water do right? we drink water we swim in it, okay? it surrounds us, uh, everything, the whole earth is uh, two-thirds, more than two-thirds uh, water. So I guess uh, faith, organic faith is, as we said, if it is as it is, because it comes from the great I am, that I am, then it's been there, it's been delivered once and for all, and it's like taking a fruit from that whole big creation, that big uh, garden that God created and say, hey, this is faith. And that's what we're trying to do. That's the hardest part because we want somebody to, hey, I give you the faith or the seed of God. Okay? Enjoy eating that. Okay? Relish it. It was meant to do, do you good. This is exactly what you need, so eat that. So when you eat that, no, it's hard to explain because you have to eat that and enjoy. Ah, this is how life should be. This is what faith should be. But then, that fruit also has a seed. It doesn't stop there. It's not enough that faith will benefit you. 
Yeah, there is a whole process of planting that. You have to reproduce yourself. So I guess by the time it will be difficult at this point to present a specific, uh, I know what you mean, a specific doctrine or specific uh, teaching. I think I should go back to uh, what, uh, is it Isaiah 28 when uh, the prophet was saying that uh, the people of his time, of course he was prophesying and Jesus would uh, use his, uh, that verse or his statement to describe the same people in his uh, generation that you are just like the people in olden times. But because you are blind, you are deaf, you do not understand. God has laid down precept by precept, precept by precept, line by line, line by line, but he doubles it and a, a little here, a little there. So uh, laying down this, uh, the, today I, I hope we could uh, discuss this key of truth, okay, or the key of knowledge that uh, we have missed in understanding what faith is all about. It's not just organicness or what is the faith that has been delivered. You cannot take it in one whole <laughs> uh, view, okay? You can't grasp this the whole significance of what faith or organic faith is all about. You have to take it chab la chab, chab la chab, kab la kab, kab la kab, e ersham, e ersham. So precept by precept, okay? principle by principle, line by line, a little here, a little there. So that's what it's going to be a long process, so our listeners should be <laughs> very patient with us. But basically, that's how I would react to Brother Dan's summary. Right. Uh, a yeah. lot of the time... I have a question. Oh, go ahead. I have a question with Brother Vince. Go ahead, Brother. Uh, is, yeah. faith, is the word faith and gospel the same or different? Because in the book of Romans one seventeen, the Apostle Paul said, uh, first in verse 16 he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. Then verse 17 he said, for in the, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So I would like to ask the question. Is faith and gospel the same? Or gospel and faith the same? So what's the difference? If you are talking about organic faith, so I let, what is uh, the, already, uh, I what is the contribution talked. or the relation of the gospel with the faith? Because when you talk about faith, it's also the gospel. Yeah, you already answered your uh, question. But I let uh, Shane uh, speak his mind because I will okay. already... He talked at length, and I will come after him. Um, well, maybe just to tackle a little bit, because I feel like what Dan is asking is kind of what we are getting at when we're trying to explain what it is we're doing here. We're trying to describe something without being short and sweet, you know, because I feel like we're dealing with a, if we keep this brief, and we keep this quick that we sacrifice so much that we end up with a shallow and vague notion of organic faith. We're trying to tackle and get our, get to um, the meat of the subject. What I mean by that is to explain and to in a way that everybody could just understand and it'd be like, yes, this could be like a doctrine, would be in a way acting in a manner that I feel like our faith has always been against. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when we, in Jesus' ministry, in Jesus' gospel, I see a lot of a need for reflection a lot of time for um, meditation. His parables are not direct. They do not address the problem. They tell people to think, right? To uh, reflect on what they understand in the spirit. 
because trying to encapsulate the words you know it's like if i came in and i gave you the one word explanation to a parable i feel like you do the parable a disservice right for being so uh, direct because a lot of times faith revolves around reflection you don't really get to have that one 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 interpretation and it's done i understand the lesson that i was being taught today because there's a lot of complexity to this and there's a lot of things that we don't know or don't understand and that over time things become either more clear or more unclear faith is kind of something that keeps us on the path right we're striving for that ideal that I feel like promotes life. And that's a vague. That's a vague. That's a vague statement in itself. So faith and gospel. Gospel is in a, in a sense a pathway for us because Jesus didn't exact. In some ways, he told us blatantly what we have to do, but its implementation is not clear. Love God. Love your neighbor. I'd say that's a simple and clear command, but when it's time to implement that, right? What do we do? And how does our faith direct us? Yeah, in a sense, faith and the gospel share a similar thing. I wouldn't say they're one and the same. I share that they may branch out of each other. Like I'd say the gospel branches out of faith, but I wouldn't say that the gospel is faith entirely because we have other things mm -hmm in our own tradi in our own uh, Bible that we have to step back through because Christ kind of revitalizes the tradition there or he tells them look you have systematized our faith and you're using it as a way to gain the system that is life in a sense I, I'd say that uh, my readings Christ doesn't use Christ does not like the systematized and almost and you know to relate it back to topic an inorganic means of uh, trying to um, promote the kingdom to promote life. Yeah, am I making sense? Yeah, you're basically yeah, okay, we paraphrasing. Yeah, I am in a sense paraphrasing. Uh, most people, of course. People, people would like to like the Jews. Uh, they were accused by Christ of uh, wanting to see signs. Why? Because a sign is like a fireworks. Like the fireworks, they buy it. Bang! Oh! It's like a flash of genius, a serendipity. Oh, that's it. That's what it is. Hallelujah! And then after a while, you die down. The euphoria is lost. Because as Shane said, you lost the diligence, the, the endurance, the perseverance to uh, go through the hardship of applying your faith. Okay, uh, to say it uh, succinctly or briefly, the gospel is the source of your faith. One comes after the other. Okay? Because the faith is, I mean, gospel is the good news. But as we said, the good news about Christ had already been given in the garden now why because man and woman fell so the only good news that could uh, befall humanity since that time was the giving of the seed so we keep talking about seed uh, talking about organic we were talking about plants but god's seed of the word which is the gospel he planted by the work of his uh, son whom he sent because he's the seed. And we have a lot of things to say about the seed. Right? It's not by blood or by birth that you uh, find salvation or justification. It is faith. It is uh, not being a Jew, but believing. Would you say that we're, in, in a sense, we're kind of describing the growth of the seed from this? We're trying to, un we're trying to unpack right because there were this the seed is not a simple thing this thing branches out in ways that we can't understand or fathom but at the same time we all want to say let's not touch it 
because we don't know what we're messing with. And you can't you can't shake the feeling that there's something off about something institutionalized, right? Because you feel like it's affecting your the faith. It's branching out in ways that just weren't meant to be. And whether how far can we go that we should not touch it and leave it be and let it develop on its own? And you know, I I understand that that. It, that can come with risks and misinterpretations, but I think that we're we're gonna get into the meat of that topic eventually because, uh, you know, um, all of us understand that we can't explain the spirit. We can see its fruits, right? As I believe you quoted that uh, last uh, in our last discussion about, uh, we can see the spirit in its fruits. And by then, it's like you just have to wait and see. And faith can be like that, that you just don't know whether or not your actions will bear fruit that will promote life or promote the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Good point, good point. You use the word uh, that uh, would uh, express everything. You want to unpack everything that is in the seed. So the seed is very important. No? We discuss about the seed that uh, whatever God had given in the beginning was already pure, organic, uh, God made, God given, God created, God designed. So it will benefit, it will reproduce what it was meant to uh, create or reproduce. So I guess the gospel of Christ is nothing but the giving of the promise. We call him the promised seed. Okay, but what is the result of the promise? That's what we're trying to tackle or bring out here, to unpack. So how? what is the key of truth that will help us to solve or to finally answer Brother Dan's uh, question? What is the key of truth that will allow anyone, I'm not talking of uh, learned or theologians or whatever uh, seminary bred a teacher, uh, who's uh, trained or qualified to preach the gospel, the ordinary person can use that key of truth, which by the way, if I may ask Brother Dan, uh, Luke 11.52, please, Brother Dan, can you please read that in you have your Tagalog Bible? Since Luke, uh, Luke Gospel of Luke 11.52. Yeah, to start off, the, uh, it will take a whole process to answer your question, but let's be begin anyway before we... Woe unto you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who are entering. Uh, okay, this is one of the uh, woes, wow. one of the curses. But Thank go ahead, Brother Dan, you have something Tagalog to say. Tagalog version? Uh, Tagalog version or uh, English? Christ is saying here, uh, the word who means you are uh, condemned or you are uh, you are no, no good. I take because pity you on you. Away. The, key, the key to knowledge, the key to knowledge of course is uh, what? It uh -huh. is uh, understanding, right? Accepting the word of God right. as it is, you yourselves have not entered, and you have entered those who were entering. Well, the key to knowledge is, I think, Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Amen. when uh, the exactly of the lower, I think when Christ, uh, or, or, when Christ was saying you were, hello, you were yeah, uh, right. getting the key to knowledge. Uh, you are removing God or you might say the organic faith, uh, they are trying to hinder them. No, but he called them, Brother Dan, I'll ask you a question. He called them, he called them experts of the law. In uh, my word, New King James Version, it says, Woe to you lawyers. That is what they think about themselves. They try to become experts of the law because they were the yeah. ones transcribing, explaining, but in reality, they were not really experts. So, so it is just 
heard of a sarcastic uh, remark of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. They are not really experts because if they were really experts, they would know what the law uh, would be teaching about Christ, right? Hmm. Yeah, right. So uh, it's, for me, it's a kind of uh, sarcastic remark. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm just contemplating on that. I believe that he meant what he said when they were experts of the law. I'm not. I'm. I'm open to interpreting that as a sarcasm. I don't think that uh, that's not a legitimate way of interpreting it. I'm for that. I just think that there, there's. I think that he's in. He's addressing a. The institution. I think their implementation, their technique, and I think then you were really. Close to what I think about the passage, which is the understanding part of this. I think that they are experts, and I think that they understand the letter of these laws. But I feel like what Christ is calling into question is their understanding of the law. What exactly was the spirit behind the law? A lot of the time, I think that the ma the main the main problem with the Pharisees is is that they were trying to game the system what do i mean by that i mean like they're trying to game god's law and say look if we can optimize this we can behave optimally we must indulge in these in tokenizing things we these token gestures will resolve this okay have you done dot 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 Okay, we can formulize this, you know, we can make a formula and then we can just say, okay, you haven't done this, 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 this. We, human beings, can judge you as perfect or, un, you know, sinless because you did the following. You followed the numbers. We crunched the numbers and you see that as one, a flaw in something when you try to institutionalize something that I feel like is not institutionalizable. Is that, if that's an okay word to describe it. Yeah, right? makes sense. And it's like, woe to you. I pity you who are condemned because you mislead others. You teach people to game a system that is not meant to be gamed you bring in false authority and you know that in the scripture that that has been what they he has described them as a false authority and i think that we should really go deep with that that a false authority what does that mean it means that they have come up with these conclusions that just one in a spiritual sense just does not come in touch with the spirit this is more us acting in token gestures you know you understand that in when we're addressing the organic right in a, a complaint that we've had is is that you attend church because you know you have to attend church and that by attending church you gain favor from god that's not the right you we feel as though that isn't the right ugali to do things the ugali to just do it because it looks good we're doing it just so that we can face God and say, look, I, this is my work. I've done my token gesture. I've done these things. And you know I use that word token because it's like the, the, the reason behind the action is so that you look like you've done work. Does it make sense? Like there are times when the work is to look like you're working. And don't you feel like the reason behind that is to game a system? Does it make sense? And that these experts of the law, talaga, they're experts of the law, a law that they have gamified, they have treated outside of its place, and they are authorities to that place. And you. The word that comes to mind as I describe this is like sophistry. And I think you two know what I mean when I say sophistry, right? Is is that this isn't about the truth. This is about gaming the system. Love of knowledge. Yeah. Love of knowledge. Yeah, love of knowledge, love of the truth.
Yeah, like that. You but have to display their knowledge about the law. Yeah, but if the objective is to look competent, or the objective is to um, appear worthy of the authority, that in a sense denies you that authority. And uh, as I've said before, I really think that you're contending with the image of false authority. And it just becomes something else. This isn't about faith. This is about looking faithful. And that's something that I feel like we try to do away with. right? And what we're contending with when we describe organic faith is, is that we disarm someone from trying to gain this, to institutionalize this, then treat it as something else that it is not. If that makes sense, how, how am I doing in describing this? <laughs> yeah, make, you make a lot of sense, Shane. Uh, but we have to consider the context of the verse. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and I'm I'm trying to say it as just on the visual, but I think that when we do address these single verses, that we need to take it in its full context, right? Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not contradicting you. In fact, I'm trying to explain that uh, this is one of the seven curses or seven woes that Christ uh, expressed or really released at the, that climactic point when he was in the territory or the turf of his enemies. About the lawyers, the scribes, the Pharisees. Uh, How about this? Uh, uh, what do you think about this uh, distillation, let's say? Uh, it's a symptom of the inorganic at work. Yeah, uh, but I beg, yeah, I beg your pardon. Uh, I didn't use the inorganic, but I used unorganic because inorganic something not living. But yeah, they were trying to be alive. But they were lawyers. They were leaders, religious leaders of the uh, nation of the chosen people of God. But uh, it would take a lot of, uh, you know, patience to wait for three years before Christ would uh, explode at this point and right there in their own, uh, you know, uh, bailiwick where they were, they had the power in, within their seat of power, but, you know, they were wannabes, so they were usurpers of God's throne, of God's place, because it was God's temple in the first place. But, uh, they had no place whatsoever in teaching the law or, as you said, uh, systematizing or coming up with formulas or techniques for people to follow. So they can make money out of the people. That's basically what, I guess, one of the things that those lawyers, Pharisees were doing. They turned the temple into a, what, a stock exchange. Yeah. They sold the cows, the lamb, the sheep, and everything to make money. And so they used the law, or their being learned in the law, uh, to suit their selfish interest, to promote themselves, and not God. Because precisely, they had taken away what the key of knowledge. What is the key of knowledge? It's that God was already given them the law, because the law is good, as uh, the apostles would later on explain, that the law is meant to, what, benefit the good. Because the good is not subject to the law. It is, the law is for the evil, for the sinner. Okay? So, in a sense, they were experts in the law, but they were, they themselves, they themselves were, were basically Christ was saying, you are lawbreakers. You did not enter in yourselves, meaning to say they did not have the knowledge or the wisdom in the first place. They have taken away the key of knowledge, meaning to say they didn't have the key of knowledge. So they cannot let people in to that organic uh, faith. Because here is the source or the seed himself preaching knowledge and wisdom but they rejected Christ after three years of preaching doing all those good things miracles healing all they could say was uh, well uh, you're a, what, a usurper you don't deserve to be 
called the uh, King of the Jews or whatever. We're going to crucify you. And that's what they did. So, but they're done. Yeah. Does that answer partly your question or your concern? Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, you, you were talking about experts of the law. I still believe that uh, this is sort of sarcasm uh, to me. He was calling them expert in the in 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 one sense, they were Christ was correct in say addressing them as experts of the law, but the proper interpretation of the law, they did not really know how to do it. They were trying to interpret the law literally, and to the letter, and there was no sort of uh, mercy justice. In other words, parang uh, pareho ng kapanahon yeah. natin ngayon yan. There are there are legal experts that uh, would say, for example, the use of face mask or shield. Uh, yes. You have to use it all the time. Similar to that, uh, what is happening today? Uh, they are very. They want to obey the law to the letter, and that is what Christ was saying uh, to them here in this particular passage. Who unto you, you think that you are uh, expert, but actually. You are uh, hindering people to enter the kingdom because your interpretation or application of the law is not right. Mm. So uh, that is my perception about that particular verse. I'd say we're all in agreement with that interpretation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can use the law, any good thing you can use as a weapon against uh, the people, to oppress people, to deceive people, make money out of them. Anybody can do that. Everybody's doing that nowadays. So, you have to be careful. Um, I guess uh, the, the whole point there is Christ already mentioned that there is such a thing of as a key of knowledge or key of truth. So, anyway, that's our initial verse. So, unless you have uh, other things to say, we can proceed to uh, laying down uh, the first step toward understanding uh, the question is going back to our discussion our main discussion now how did the seed uh, bring the gospel or what we call organic faith uh, we said that organic relationship was lost in Eden back in paradise and for so many times until through the time of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and everyone else, the prophets, and to the days, uh, the days of the apostles, when Christ came, the, that faith had not been delivered so long. How many years did that? 4,000 years, brother Dan? Maybe, no? 4,000 years. That was 2,000 years ago. Yeah, more or less, 4,000 years. So, exactly how did uh, the Holy Spirit uh, deliver the, the faith or that organic faith? Of course, we all know that the Holy Spirit was there in the creation of the universe. It was hovering, uh, Genesis 1, verse 1? Chapter, yeah, chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit oh, yeah. uh, was upon the face of the waters. Yeah, it was upon the face of the waters and he was hovering. Uh, the idea of contemplating over the darkness or the chaos that existed before God created order, put order. So the Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit uh, was also there uh, leading or guiding all those messengers of the apostles, the judges, the prophets that God sent to remind people that they should go back to God. To God. But then again, that promise seed had not been given. Okay, the redemption of humanity, uh, once God decided to destroy all humans except for eight souls during the time of Noah. Okay, but just, just to renew the earth, this creation, but of course, man continues to sin even up to this time. But uh, as, as we said, how did uh, the apostles deliver that message from the Holy Spirit? Remember that Christ, when he taught 
he was crucified, he died, and he resurrected. He went up. And I think in John chapter 16, he said that, uh, I will not leave you helpless. Okay, because I go to the Father, but I will send you the Comforter, and he will reveal to you everything. Okay, everything that I have taught. Okay, so Christ, it was Christ who delivered uh, organic faith. Okay, what was already prophesied in the garden, Christ fulfilled through his ministry. But then, it was the Holy Spirit, as Christ promised, he will bring to your uh, knowledge, your recollection, or to your understanding, everything that I had said. Yeah, but then you have something. Correct. Okay. So, well, uh, uh, again, talking about the Holy Spirit, what? Yeah. When did when when were these apostles uh, empowered so that they would be able to speak uh, properly and with boldness? Well, Acts chapter two, the, the twelve apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and after that they were able to speak in tongues. Peter preached the gospel, and exactly. that was the start right. of the church. Acts chapter two. And then he said, "Those who have been baptized." will be forgiven of their sins and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that started that Acts chapter 2. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even Christ, when he was, again, uh, started this, when he started his ministry, uh, what happened when John the Baptist, or the baptizer, immersed him? In the uh, river Jordan, I believe. You with spirit and with fire. John chapter, I uh, know, Matthew 3. Yeah, so he received the Holy Spirit in fullness. And uh, that's uh, the point when Christ said, or God said, or the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So hear ye him. So it was like his uh, go signal, go ahead. This is the promised seed, my Son. So even God has a seed that is Christ. Okay, he reproduced Christ, as he said, in the same way that God reproduced or interpreted himself to Adam. He was the first Adam, and Christ is also referred to as the second Adam. So he was reproduced as a human being, but he is uh, God in fullness. No? So uh, he received the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it was the Holy Spirit who was leading him, even during his temptation. It was the Holy Spirit who was sending him where he should go and protecting him. And when he left, he said, I will send the Holy Spirit to be your guide. And will you please, uh, to continue, can you please read First Corinthians 1, Father Dan, 20 to 25? Chapter 1, verse 20. Yeah, yeah. 25? 20 to 25. Yeah, please. Okay. Chapter 1. This is okay. Paul already uh, speaking. Okay, it's here. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The Jews demanded miraculous signs, and the Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preached Christ crucified, stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness of the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty to twenty-five. Hmm. Yeah. So, what is that saying? What is that we're saying? Uh, that's Paul already, you know, one of the apostles. So, he already had that spirit. Yeah, he was talking about God's wisdom is far more superior than the wisdom of man, and he calls the wisdom of man uh, the wisdom of this world as foolishness in the sight of God. So, uh, and people are uh, talking about the cross, the the death of Christ on the cross, many people believe it was foolishness. 
foolishness to believe in someone who was crucified and would anchor our faith and salvation in person who was crucified. And that is to the word is foolishness. Um, okay. I, I would like, if you yeah, guys don't mind, um, for something to kind of contend with here, I'm going to channel a a voice of of um, me. It might be a bit tad immature, and someone who just who feels like results just happen like that is if they were already given the knowledge and this understanding. Why is it that you do not feel or see that reflected now? Why does it feel like that knowledge did not carry itself all the way to now and we don't live in this paradise already because despite the fact that they've been granted this knowledge? Good question because this is Paul exactly expressing what you're feeling, Shane. So that was 2,000 years ago? Yeah. It was 2,000 years ago, and we can almost say the same thing, Brother Dan, Brother Shane. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Are you saying, where is the lawyer? Okay, you saying, where's the piracy? Where's the scribe? So, I do want to clarify, I am channeling this voice. I have my own thoughts on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but uh, let's not go get too far. But... Uh, the wisdom of God. Oh yeah, go ahead, brother Dan. Let me answer that. Uh, let me answer that question of Xian or Xian. <laughs> okay, the answer to that question is: during the time of Paul, it was already the gospel was already being uh, tortured, tormented. The book of Galatians, right. chapter one, verse six to nine. The apostle Paul said. Do we or an angel from heaven would preach to you another gospel? Let him be anathema. Then First Timothy chapter uh, 4, he had a prophecy that some will be departing from the faith. So, from the time of Paul up to our present time, uh, how many years is that? So even during the time of Paul, there were already Paul's teachers, Paul's prophets, Paul's apostles. So how much more even to this time? So you are correct. We have to restore the organic faith so that we will be like during the time of the Apostle Paul. We have the natural, the New Testament faith, the organic faith, the original faith of the Apostles and the Christians. Okay? Thank you, Dan. That was... Does that make sense? That, that one was... Does that make sense? You truly shined right here, you know. You can uh, cut, right. cut, cut that bit. You can cut that out. Vince, but that re you really shined right there, <laughs> Dan. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. You you indulged yeah. and answered a voice that lingers in many of the minds of a believer. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Dan. That was. Uh, a I guess at this point, I at this point it may not be uh, proper to go ahead uh, with the main agenda of part two so we just uh, summarized our definition and cleaned up some uh, uh, loose ends okay dealt with loose ends because uh, we, we we went on a we had a rough start but i think we had a good start and hopefully we we have been able to help people who may be listening in to us by the way thank you for watching and listening to us thank you very much for your viewing and uh, if you have questions just feel free to ask them and we'll answer your questions next video thank you thank you thank you for our listeners and for those who are uh, taking time to listen and we would appreciate your comments and hopefully you uh, subscribe to this channel and or share our videos and other podcasts and just click uh, the links given below and uh, get more free podcasts, uh, music, books, and other articles. Thank you and God bless everyone. Thank you everyone for listening to this. Uh, our chan This opportunity for us to express our thoughts. We you are kind of witnessing us uh, explore a topic and 
I'm glad you, I, I hope you found it entertaining, and I hope that you gained insight from this. And at the very least, I do not hope that we mislead you in any way, that you take on a responsibility for yourself to contemplate on your faith, on what it is you believe, and hopefully you take an end out of this way to promote life around you, maybe even to promote the kingdom. Thank you. And we hope, we hope uh, you can do that again. Yeah, thanks, Vince. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely. Paglilingkot Ang buti ng langit Ay nasa iyong puso Ang buhay mo'y hinug na Sa panahon Kasaysayan ang kaularan May mga pangakong ganting pala Ang ilaw ng kapayapaan Ang bunga ng katarungan Ang awit ng kasaganan At lahi ng pagkakaisa Sa kasaysayan ng kamalayan Ang susi ay katotohanan